And so now we're ready to go. <laughs> and we're live. Welcome, everybody, to the weekly get together of the IED Network. And uh, we've been doing this for about seven straight years. And, and we've got another full show, and I don't know how many out in the, out in the bleachers <laughs> playing with us. But I sure appreciate you coming. And tonight we launched the beginning of a training series that we've been doing for quite a while. Things that I think actually are pretty good at helping uh, artistic type people do better in the marketplace. It's what we've been struggling with for a very long time. We started this whole operation and try and help each other succeed in the marketplace for over 30 years ago. So we've been at it for quite a while. Somebody still got their mic open, so make sure you got all your mics closed, okay? It comes through with just a ton of racket when you don't. Joni? I don't have you, a mic. <laughs> you don't have a way to... Sh there you go. Now you got it shut down. Now we're all okay. Um, I started a number of years ago doing several sets of shows on really challenging concepts in the marketplace, things that normally give everybody fits. And it takes quite a while to get a handle on those things eventually. And so... We're going to launch tonight with a series of three shows on personal branding. And I put a hell of a lot of work into this as well as tried to improve it in my own circumstances and then try and coach our master circle on what it takes to succeed in this particular direction as well. So even though all of you have done to one degree or another a certain amount of success in your life and your career, branding, personal branding is just a never-ending story. You have to continuously work at it, observe it, focus it. It's like the reins of your, your ship, your wagon. You either steer it where you want it to go or you don't do anything and it just ends up somewhere else. I don't see how in the marketplace you can succeed like you'd like without a really strong personal brand. So I'm going to get right at it tonight and uh, we'll do our thing first and then we'll talk about it. Okay. Somebody give me a heads up if you see the three key rules of marketing. Yep, it's there. Yep, we've got it. Got her? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, as much as you see on the web, but especially on Google Plus now, you see some about personal branding, but you see a tremendous about, amount about uh, relationship marketing. And that's what we've been teaching and preaching and pra practicing for 30 years. So it really is something we've kind of sharpened our teeth on for a long time. And if you haven't figured it out yet, there's just no, no excuse anymore for staying behind and falling behind or not being able to use this really, really significant tool. <coughs> I've been doing this show for seven straight years and I try and improve it every, every year before I launch it. I launch it about this time. We've spent the month of January going after Aiming Your Life, which is the the one tough test of figuring out what your long-term goals and hopes and dreams are. Then we launch it into the three stages of the personal branding process. And I hope you'll begin to see tonight more about personal branding than perhaps you ever have before. Uh, this show tonight is dedicated to Jose Valencia because of all the people sitting in on this show. He's the one tonight that really needs to pay attention to this now. He's just closed the largest deal he's ever had in his life. <laughs> and we had so much fun on the phone last night talking about it and where he's going to go next and what he's going to do. So, Jose, this one's for you, bud. And all the rest of you get to listen in, okay? Um, I have a lot of artists around me who don't pay much attention to business. They, they, they got all the art books. They could draw and paint and sculpt and carve forever. They've got everything they need in that side of things, and yet 
you couldn't count on one hand the business books that they've read this year or the business courses they've taken or that attention to that side of the equation and if business and making money with your talent is is both how good your work is and how well you do your marketing how can it be anything else uh, I want to inter all, introduce all, you, all of you to Sonia Patterson. Sonia's is uh, up by Janet Bassett up in uh, Canada and uh, Sonia's had her equipment for a little while and she's asked for some extra help and so I had quite a long visit with her Monday night and getting things ready to go and I'm going to record my phone calls with Sonia so that we can have a way of multiplying this effort to help you get started. But I don't see how if you don't make yourself a promise to do as good with your business side of your managing as you do with the managing of your artistic skills, how in the world do you expect to get paid or to do it well or gradually, heaven forbid, get do it better? I don't want to ever have you in a conversation with me not remember who Tom Peters is. Okay, if there's one person in the planet that you need to pay attention to and remember, it's Tom Peters. Okay, he is the guy that coined the personal branding idea and brought it in the marketplace. And if you've not read Reimagine, holy heavens, what a book to read. It will just split your soul in half. It, it's just amazing. He is considered the really one of the number one business gurus in the world. And, and I'm, I'm trying to help people understand that if you're going to get good at business, that means you've got to know more about it. You can't just automatic. The only other option is sit around and wait for somebody to do it for you. And we all know how that kind of turns out. So the idea of being able to do better at this whole progress, this whole process is what I call my master's program. It's a development discovery that you have some ability, then the gradual development of that ability to a level of mastery, something that you're getting really good at both the work and the marketing. And then we teach each other and help each other share that talent from then on. And I just don't think there's an organization out there in the world quite like what we've got with the I&E. &E. Um, I mentioned that we've been working on uh, aiming your life for the first month of the year. Now we're going to go through the branding process and then we'll launch into upscale marketing and then we'll finish this series with pricing issues. Because of all the three business concepts that most artists have screwed up or that they ignore, it's these three concepts. And as we start into part one tonight, what I'm hoping is that you'll begin to realize there's something really important about branding. And if we can get through that, this next two or three shows, I'm going to just plead with you not to, if you get through this one, then don't not get two and three in, okay? It doesn't make a lot of sense to do it otherwise. Another person that I don't want to ever hear that you don't know who this person is, is Linda Kaplan Thaler. And you do know her, you just don't remember that you know her. She wrote a book called Getting Your Message Heard in a Noisy World. Does that sound like something an artist ought to read? Getting Heard in a Noisy World? Um, you all know Linda, and I've interacted with her now twice. I'm trying to talk her into coming to Park City to meet my friend out here. And uh, so far she's so busy she has a hard time getting into my life. But she's, uh, her company is the Thayer Group, and they are a billion a year in sales. And what launched their entire career was this one right here. <clears throat> Anybody on the show that doesn't know what, <laughs> who that represents and what company it represents and how unique their whole effort is, and they were totally unknown advertising agency and then this company asked them to to represent them and they said Aflac who are you kidding me what the kind of a name is that for a company and they hadn't gotten anything done yet and she went out and hollered off she was down getting something off the stand <clears throat> one of those uh, stands in New York and food stands and 
she just screamed it out. She was so frustrated, and the echo came off the building and came back Affleck like the echo of a duck. And that's what led them to this particular, which is their, their huge success story. So you just don't ever want to forget Linda. This is somebody else that you ought to follow and you ought to pay attention to. I can pull out a book on John Singer Sargent and damn near every art person I know knows who that work is. They don't even have to see the title on it, the name on it. They know it's John Singer Sargent or they know it's Rodin or they know it's and usually you like certain artists so you know of them and their work. But how many business people have you locked into? Their thinking and what their degree of success that's brought them success. And I think it's just, I try to do that for you here, okay? The brand is to help people remember who you are and what you do. And we just can't ever let up on that. Because in most cases, it has to have it has some really unusual elements to branding. Okay, uh, when we're trying to connect with people, there's several reasons we're trying to connect, and we use all of these assets to help people remember who we are. And I, everyone says they're the five senses, but they're really the seven senses. Okay. Sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, and the sixth sense is intuitive, and the seventh sense is imagination. And, and nobody in marketing doesn't understand that these are the deadly, deadly tools of marketing. You want to have your interaction with a person reach as many of these as you can so that they then can remember who you are, okay? And tonight I'm going to try and shift your thinking. I'm going to try and help you realize not only is it important, but you can do it. You can start tonight. And as you begin to do something with this concept, then the miracle shows up, okay? There's three really big problems in trying to sell somebody something. The first big problem is people's memories are really short. And the second big problem is there's way too much competition in the marketplace. It's really, really hard to remember uh, all the options. And then the third one is to realize that the Internet is now becoming the leading exposure tool in the world. You can no longer ignore it. If you depend on your old business marketing tools to connect with your customers and your patrons and your new leads and inquiries, you're going to fall short sooner or later because the whole world is moving this way. And so if I can help you begin to get a better sense of what's going on with that, maybe you'll realize, holy mackerel, this is big stuff now. All marketers know this number. The survey provides an overwhelming evidence that the Internet is at the center of decision-making for consumers now. It suggests definitively that marketers who do not have end-to-end -end strategies which put digital influence at the center of their marketing plans are doing so at their own peril. Marketers who get it will be able to leapfrog their competitors who won't get it. There's a number, uh, it's called the Marketing Interaction Index. and uh, it used to be, remember, you remember me telling it was 3,000 interactions a day, 3,000 hits on every person, business buying decisions per day. But now it's clear up to 5,000. You, you just have to realize that everybody's getting just pounded in the marketplace to try and buy something, okay? Advertisers seem to fill every last spot on the, in the marketplace. There's not a single place left that you can't see some kind of advertising. They're selling, even on U.S. Airways, uh, ads on the motion sickness bags. <laughs> and I read an article where this one company put their ad on all of the slip covers for the plastic slip covers for the laundry. When you go in the laundry, they've got now ads on those plastic bags as well. So there's just absolutely nowhere you can't be hit by some business buying marketing decision. Now this you need to kind of begin to get a real handle on because this is the marketing decision journey. 
from some degree of awareness to a degree of familiarity and then they start weighing it out and then they finally purchase and after that whole sequence hopefully is loyalty because without a repeat purchase you're not really getting anywhere and you've got to remember how this works and realize there's six steps in there there's from the very beginning effort right through the, the loyalty and relationship there's generally five to six steps before anybody ever decides to actually go ahead and buy something from you and as long as you're a pretty savvy marketer you begin to realize well if I've got to if people are getting hit with 5,000 business decisions a day the number one problem is being remembered even if you get a good shot at somebody it's really slim that you'll actually ever sell them something and this is as true for all of us who are carving eggshells or are doing motorcycles or carving tree trunks it, it's just huge to remember how this purchasing process this decision-making journey actually works imagine that a consumer had to buy a car as with most kinds of products a consumer will immediately be able to name an initial consideration set of brands to purchase in our qualitative research consumers told us that the fragmenting of media and the proliferation of products has actually made them reduce the number of brands they consider based at a plethora of choices and communications consumers tend to fall back on the limited set of brands and have made it through the wilderness of messages brand awareness matters brands in the initial consideration set can be up to three times more likely to purchase now that's a 300 percent increase in the odds and if Woody Searle was on the show with me tonight and he kind of is in memory he would say listen folks pay attention if you can't figure out how to stack the deck don't go into business if you're gonna go to sit down and play cards and trade with Vegas you had better know what the game is and how the cards are played and when to play them and 90 percent of the artistic types I meet don't even have a clue what those 52 cards are. they don't even know there's four aces much less whether they've got the four aces and they sure as hell don't know when to play them so wouldn't it be important to learn the game and how to play it <clears throat> most people are now becoming really turned off by the the proliferation of advertising and the amount of exposure and so that's now becoming a huge huge issue in the marketplace uh, I stumbled on to this guy quite a while ago and Barry has written a book his books called the uh, paradox of choice and when I saw it in Barnes & Noble I just saw the egg in the middle of the the box and it was so much similar to what my brand picture is I couldn't walk past it but of all the books you ought to read you can't not know who Barry Schwartz is now you've got to understand because what Barry has researched his whole life and spent his whole life learning is makes a big difference on the overall degree of your business. this isn't just for, and for large corporations it's stuff for you because what's happening in the marketplace is people are deciding not to decide now there's just too much out there now I've got a I want to I want to stop the show now for a minute and see if I can figure out how to get Barry's talk up okay I want you to actually he just did a TED talk and I want to try and see if I can't go find that here now and uh, play it for you it's just fun to listen to him and it might actually get you guys to want to come out and go after a little more Let's see if I can launch it on this one. Well, come on here.
No, we don't want to do it there. We want to do it right there. YouTube videos right there. And then we want to do very Swartz ART. How do you spell his name? Who the hell can remember that? Swartz. S C H W A R T Z. There you go. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ed Joyman. <laughs> yeah, you're having fun. Where is, uh, actually, you know what? They're trying to make me go another route. Let me see if I can do it this way. Spell again for me. Just put Z right there. Z right there? That's all it needs. Right there. As a zebra. Easy. No, easy. All right. Now there should be, it should be right in here with him. Oh, they don't want to bring it up. Paradise. Paradox of choice YouTube right there. Okay, can you see that now, guys? You should. Yes. How about the audio? Can you hear it? Well, we could. I want to talk to you about some stuff that's in this book of mine that I hope will resonate with other things that you've already heard, and I'll try to make some connections myself in case you Good. miss them. But Double we'll audio or not? With what I the audio call okay. the official Good. dogma. Good. The Good. official dogma of what? The official dogma of all Western industrial societies. And the official dogma runs like this. If we are interested in maximizing the welfare of our citizens, the way to do that is to maximize individual freedom. The reason for this is both that freedom is in and of itself good, valuable, worthwhile, essential to being human, and because if people have freedom, then each of us can act on our own to do the things that will maximize our welfare, and no one has to decide on our behalf. The way to maximize freedom is to maximize choice. The more choice people have, the more freedom they have, and the more freedom they have, the more welfare they have. This, I think, is so deeply embedded in the water supply that it wouldn't occur to anyone to question it. And it's also deeply embedded in our lives. I'll give you some examples of what modern progress has made possible for us. This is my supermarket, not such a big one. I want to say just a word about salad dressing. 175 salad dressings in my supermarket, if you don't count the 10 extra virgin olive oils and 12 balsamic vinegars you could buy to make a very large number of your own salad dressings in the off chance that none of the 175 the store has on offer suit you. So this is what the supermarket is like. And then you go to the consumer electronics store to set up a stereo system, speakers, CD player, tape player, tuner, amplifier, and in this one single consumer electronics store, there are that many stereo systems. We can construct six and a half million different stereo systems out of the components that are on offer in one store. You gotta admit that's a lot of choice. In other domains, the world of uh, communications. There was a time when I was a boy when you could get any kind of telephone service you wanted as long as it came from Ma Bell. You rented your phone, you didn't buy it. One consequence of that, by the way, is that the phone never broke. And um, those days are gone. We now have an almost unlimited variety of phones, especially in the world of cell phones. These are cell phones of the future. My favorite is the middle one, the 
MP3 player, nose hair trimmer, and creme brulee torch. And if, if by some chance you haven't seen that in your store yet, you can rest assured that one day soon you will. And what this does is it leads people to walk into their stores asking this question. And do you know what the answer to this question now is? The answer is no. It is not possible to buy a cell phone that doesn't do too much. So, in other aspects of life that are much more significant than uh, buying things, the same uh, explosion of choice is true. Healthcare. It is no longer the case in the United States that you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you what to do. Instead, you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, well, we could do A or we could do B. A has these benefits and these risks. B has these benefits and these risks. What do you want to do? And you say, Doc, what should I do? And the doc says, A has these benefits and risks, and B has these benefits and risks. What do you want to do? And you say, if you were me, Doc, what would you do? And the doc says, but I'm not you. And the result is, we call it patient autonomy, which makes it sound like a good thing. But what it really is, is a shifting of the burden and the responsibility for decision making from somebody who knows something, namely the doctor, to somebody who knows nothing and is almost certainly sick and thus not in the best shape to be making decisions, namely the patient. Uh, there's enormous marketing of prescription drugs to people like you and me, which if you think about it, makes no sense at all since we can't buy them. Why do they market to us if we can't buy them? The answer is that they expect us to call our doctors the next morning and ask for our prescriptions to be changed. Something as dramatic as our identity is now become a matter of choice, uh, as this slide is meant to uh, indicate. We get to, we don't inherit an identity, we get to invent it, and we get to reinvent ourselves as often as we like. And that means that every day when you wake up in the morning, you have to decide what kind of person you want to be. Um, in, uh, with respect to marriage and family, there was a time when the default assumption that almost everyone had is that you got married as soon as you could and then you started having kids as soon as you could. Uh, the only real choice was who, not when and not what you did after. Nowadays, everything is very much up for grabs. I teach wonderfully intelligent students and uh, I assign 20% less work than I used to and it's not because they're less smart, and it's not because they're less diligent, it's because they are preoccupied asking themselves, should I get married or not? Should I get married now? Should I get married later? Should I have kids first or a career first? All of these are consuming questions, and they're going to answer these questions whether or not it means not doing all the work I assign and not getting a good grade in my courses. And indeed they should. These are important questions to answer. Um, work. We are blessed, as Carl is pointing out, with technology that enables us to work every minute of every day from any place on the planet, except the Randolph Hotel. <laughs> there is one corner, by the way, that I'm not going to tell anybody about where you actually where the where the high Wi-Fi works. I'm not telling you about it because I want to use it. Um, so what this means, this incredible freedom of choice we have with respect to work, is that we have to make a decision again and again and again about whether we should or shouldn't be working. We can go to watch our kids play soccer, and we have our cell phone on one hip, and our Blackberry on our other hip, and our laptop presumably on our laps. And even if they're all shut off, every minute that we're watching our kid mutilate a soccer game, we are also asking ourselves, should I answer this cell phone call, should I respond to this email, should I draft this letter? And even if the answer to the question is no, it's certainly going to make the experience of your kid's soccer game very different than it would. <coughs> so everywhere we look, uh, uh, big things and small things, material things and lifestyle things, life is a matter of choice. And the world we used to live in looked like this. That is to say, there were some choices, but not everything was a matter of choice. And the world we now live in looks like this. And the question is, is this good news or bad news? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we all know what's good about it, so I'm going to talk about what's bad about it. All of this choice has two effects. 
two negative effects on people. One effect, paradoxically, is that it produces paralysis rather than liberation. With so many options to choose from, people find it very difficult to choose at all. I'll give you one very dramatic example of this, a study that was done of uh, investments in uh, voluntary retirement plans. Uh, Colin Klein <coughs> got access to um, investment records from Vanguard, the gigantic mutual fund company of about a million employees in about 2,000 different workplaces. And what she found is that for every 10 mutual funds the employer offered, rate of participation went down 2%. You offer 50 funds, 10% fewer employees participate than if you only offer five. Why? Because with 50 funds to choose from, it's so damn hard to decide which funds to choose that you'll just put it off till tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and then tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and of course tomorrow never comes. Understand that not only does this mean that people are going to have to eat dog food when they retire because they don't have enough money put away, it also means that making the decision is so hard that they pass up significant matching money from the employer. By not participating, they are passing up as much as $5,000 a year from the employer who would happily match their contribution. So paralysis is a consequence of having too many choices, and I think it makes the world look like this. You really want to get the decision right if it's for all eternity, right? You don't want to pick the wrong mutual fund or even the wrong salad dressing. So that's one effect. The second effect is that even if we manage to overcome the paralysis and make a choice, we end up less satisfied with the result of the choice than we would be if we have fewer options to choose from. And there are several reasons for this. One of them is that with a lot of different salad dressings to choose from, if you buy one and it's not perfect, and you know what salad dressing is, it's easy to imagine that you could have made a different choice that would have been better. And what happens is this imagined alternative induces you to regret the decision you made, and this regret subtracts from the satisfaction you get out of the decision you made, even if it was a good decision. The more options there are, the easier it is to regret anything at all that is disappointing about the option that you chose. Second, what economists call opportunity costs. Dan Gilbert made a big point this morning of talking about how, how much uh, the, the way in which we value things depends on what we compare them to. Well, when there are lots of alternatives to consider, it is easy to imagine the attractive features of alternatives that you reject. Uh, uh, that make it you less satisfied with the alternative that you've chosen. Here's an example. For those of you who aren't New Yorkers, I apologize. But here's what you're supposed to be thinking. Here's this couple on the Hamptons, very expensive real estate, gorgeous beach, beautiful day. They have it all to themselves. What could be better? Well, damn it, this guy is thinking it's August. Everybody in my Manhattan neighborhood is away. I could be parking right in front of my building. And he spends two weeks nagged by the idea that he is missing the opportunity day after day to have a great parking space. Opportunity costs subtract from the satisfaction we get out of what we choose, even when what we choose is terrific. And the more options there are to consider, the more attractive features of these options are going to be reflected by us as opportunity costs. Here's another example. <laughs> <laughs> now, now this, this cartoon makes a lot of points. It makes points about living in the moment as well, and probably about doing things slowly. But one point it makes is that whenever you're choosing one thing, you're choosing not to do other things, and those other things may have lots of attractive features, and it's going to make what you're doing less attractive. Third, escalation of expectations. This hit me when I went to replace my jeans. I wear jeans almost all the time. And there was a time when jeans came in one flavor, and you bought them, and they fit like crap, and they were incredibly uncomfortable. And if you wore them long enough and washed them enough times, they started to fit, feel okay. So I went to replace my jeans after years and years of wearing these old ones, and I said, I you know, want a pair of jeans. Here's my size. And the shopkeeper said, do you want slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit? Do you want button fly or zipper fly? you want stone washed or acid washed? Do you want them distressed? Do you want boot cut? Do you want tapered? Blah, 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 on and on. He went, my jaw dropped. And after I recovered, I said, 
I want the kind that used to be the only kind. <laughs> he had no idea what that was. So I spent an hour trying on all these damn jeans, and I walked out of the store, truth, with the best fitting jeans I had ever had. I did better. All this choice made it possible for me to do better. But I felt worse. Why? I wrote a whole book to try to explain this to myself. The reason is... <laughs> The reason I felt worse is that with all of these options available, my expectations about how good a pair of jeans should be went up. I had very low ex I had no particular expectations when they only came in one flavor. When they came in a hundred flavors, damn it, one of them should have been perfect. And what I got was good, but it wasn't perfect. And so I compared what I got to what I expected, and what I got was disappointing in comparison to what I expected. Adding options to people's lives can't help but increase the expectations people have about how good those options will be. And what that's going to produce is less satisfaction with, with results even when they're good results. Nobody in the world of marketing knows this. Because if they did, you wouldn't all know what this was about. The truth is more like this. The reason that everything was better back when everything was worse is that when everything was worse, it was actually possible for people to have experiences that were a pleasant surprise. Nowadays, the world we live in, we affluent industrialized citizens, with perfection, the expectation, the best you can ever hope for is that stuff is as good as you expect it to be. You will never be pleasantly surprised because your expectations, my expectations, have gone through the roof. The secret to happiness, this is what you all came for. The secret to happiness is low expectation. <laughs> You'll do. I want to say just a, a, a little autobiographical moment that uh, I actually am married to a wife and, and she's really quite wonderful. I couldn't have done better, I didn't settle. Uh, but settling isn't always such a bad thing. Finally, one consequence of buying a bad fitting pair of jeans when there is only one kind to buy is that when you are dissatisfied and you ask why, who's responsible? The answer is clear. The world is responsible. What could you do? When there are hundreds of different styles of jeans available and you buy one that is disappointing and you ask why, who's responsible? It is equally clear that the answer to the question is you. You could have done better with a thousand, with a hundred different kinds of genes on display. There is no excuse for failure. And so when people make decisions, and even though the, though the results of the decisions are good, they feel disappointed about them, they blame themselves. Clinical depression has exploded in the industrial world in the last generation. I believe a significant, not the only, but a significant contributor to this explosion of depression and also suicide is that people have experiences that are disappointing because their standards are so high and then when they have to explain these experiences to themselves they think they're at fault and so the net result is that we do better at in general objectively and we feel worse so let me remind you this is the official dogma the one that we all take to be true and it's all false it is not true. There's no question that some choice is better than none, but it doesn't follow from that that more choice is better than some choice. There's some magical amount. I don't know what it is. I'm pretty confident that we have long since passed the point where options improve our welfare. Now, as a policy matter, I'm almost done. As a policy matter, the thing to think about is this. What enables all of this choice in industrial societies is material affluence. There are lots of places in the world, and we have heard about several of them, where the, their problem is not that they have too much choice, their problem is that they have too little. So the stuff I'm talking about is the peculiar problem of modern, affluent Western societies. And what is so frustrating and infuriating is this. Steve Levitt talked to you yesterday about how these expensive and difficult to install car, uh, uh, infants, child seats don't help. It's a waste of money. 
What I'm telling you is that these expensive, complicated choices, it's not simply that they don't help. They actually hurt. They actually make us worse off. If some of what enables people in our societies to make all of the choices we make were shifted to societies in which people have too few options, not only would those people's lives be improved, but ours would be improved also. This is what economists call a Pareto improving move. Income redistribution will make everyone better off, not just poor people, because of how all this excess choice plays us. So to conclude, you're supposed to read this cartoon and being a sophisticated person say, oh, what is this fish? No. You know, nothing is possible in this fishbowl. Uh, impoverished imagination, a myopic view of the world, and that's the way I read it at first. The more I thought about it, however, the more I came to the view that this fish knows something. Because the truth of the matter is that if you shatter the fishbowl so that everything is possible, you don't have freedom, you have paralysis. If you shatter this fishbowl so that everything is possible, you decrease satisfaction. You increase paralysis and you decrease satisfaction. Everybody needs a fishbowl. This one is almost certainly too limited, perhaps even for the fish, certainly for us. But the absence of some metaphorical fishbowl is a recipe for misery and uh, I suspect disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Cedric. Barry, Barry. <clears throat> I've followed him for quite a while, and I actually know his agent that helped him get his book published, and I'm trying to talk her into picking up mine, and then if I can get mine going, then we can get yours going and just help each other all the way on up the line. <clears throat> but I hope you'll dig into the concept of discussing choice and how wide a range you have in your choices. There are some tools when we get into pricing that uh, that uh, Jose has become familiar with this last week and and utilized in his latest project, and we'll discuss those when we get into the pricing session with with Jose in a couple of, in a few weeks. But I don't know of anything that's more important than beginning to participate more on Google. If all you do is just show up, you're missing the, the whole point. It is helping us to learn together and, and lift each other's spirit and keep each other going. And that I and E function is going to become our brand as well. A really good graphic image is easy to recall. A really clever name is easy to call recall. I have never been so startled when I saw in Disney World the the light poles in Disney World literally reinforced Dim Disney's image. They don't miss a trick. There's no one in our country that doesn't know what that symbol represents. And so just a symbol can really, really it's easy to identify, it's easy to see, it's easy to recognize, and that, that starts to become the symbol of the company that they want to become. Branding got its start in Chicago. Uh, Oscar Mayer was the first brand ever. And he made sausage in Chicago on the west side, and there were so many others who made sausage, but he wanted some way to compete with him because he felt like he did a better job. And so he finally came up with his Oscar Mayer brand and labeled all of his products in a way that people then began to know that, yeah, I want to get Oscar Mayer. So it was a way to recognize, it was a way to remember, and that then in turn, uh, in turn promoted an ongoing repeat relationship, which is what we want as well. So a brand affects memory and then indirectly decisions and that then in turn affects frequency of purchase. And if you can sense that that's got something now to do with you and your work. Artists aren't selling just a single individual product. What we're selling is ourselves. 
if you created it, if you signed and you dated it, then you are the author of the art. What they'll pay more for is something that you did. If you're as good at selling you as you are at selling your work, because your work is you. And so these are things that then in turn well off people want to buy and consume and they'll keep coming back. Uh, some of you will remember my good friend Lance Turner. Lance lives here in Utah Valley and he's 84 now and he invented one of the most famous marketing sentences in all the world. There's almost no one, even a child, who can't finish the sentence that if you can only you, and you just have to say that much, and everyone can finish the sentence. I don't know how fun it would be. <laughs> I've asked him often. He was Advertiser of the Year, but he not only did it once, he did it twice. And he came up with the Charlie Sunkiss Tuna cam, advertising campaign that is still also in, in effect. So if you think it's more by accident, you'll never get a good brand developed for yourself. It isn't. It's by design. And you literally drive the boat. You set up the sails so they take you where you want to go. And when you start sensing that and begin to realize that it's as important to craft your career as it is to craft the great piece of artwork, I uh, probably have had no more access to anyone and no more interaction with anyone in the network than Craig. He's easily as fine an artist as I know, but he's also an extremely good student of both. How to do the work and also to master the marketing. And to watch Craig grow in his ability and get to the point where he can succeed even more you start to realize that his voice and his counsel is something that would be really helpful in so many occasions. But isn't that what we're trying to do with the whole master's program? Every one of our masters has a very unique voice, a unique contribution to the whole of what we're trying to grow and trying to develop. Okay, A personal brand is the boiling down version of who you want to become and what you most want to learn to trade with the world. And it is a deadly focused targeted effort. If you don't have in mind where you're going and why you're doing it uh, and you're not constantly trying to focus and sharpen your business efforts then you're out of control. And or if you don't have any road in mind then any road will do and you end up somewhere you didn't really want to end up. For years I've been sharing with you every element of my favorite part of my life, the things that I really value, the stuff that I like. It's been a gradually, gradual evolution for me to the dominant words, my favorite images, my favorite stories, and my favorite relationships are what have formed me and my career. And that's what we're trying to do then for your career. I got to go to the to the retreat Saturday over at the home studio and Tammy has and Craig and I spent some time going over his words, his dominant words. And I don't know how many times we brought that up in uh, our Thursday night session with blogging because you're going to have to start producing and publishing your favorite dominant words and you want to include those words that are guiding your life in your posts so that Google then starts sorting out, hey, Steve Willey is going this way, Chris Gardner is going that way, Greg Woodard is going another way, Jose Valencia is doing his thing, Lance Larson is doing his thing. And, and yet if you don't gather that and measure that and start formulating these, you're going to be behind. If, if a profitable hobby hadn't just shifted every gear in my life, completely redirected my way I make a life and a living, and I've just 
stood back for a while and watched Dr. Steve shift his life, Dr. Phil shift his life, Dr. Wayne shift his life, and I'm the only one with hair. I still can't quite figure out what I'm doing wrong. But we're all hell-bent on coaching and helping. We fixed our own lives first, and then that's what we have to share. And that's the reason for a master's program. You succeed at something. And in the INA network, it's something technically really decent and unique. And then it's what you learn in the process of learning how to sell it. And then you really do have some a voice to share and something to teach and to, to promote. Now, it can be really simple. Some of you look at my circumstance and make it really complicated. Or you look at someone else's life and dream, oh, gosh, if I could just be Jose Valencia. But it can be anything. You can brand anything. This guy used to be right to the side of me every time I did a show at the Salt Palace, a gun show. He would be right next to me, and he cuts out of pine slabs these little rubber guns. And he had several different unique kind of guns and these little target things to shoot at. And because he was right next to me, I started showing him how to use the engraving of the drill to help sell the guns. So if they're there getting ready to buy a rubber gun, it's always a gift for a kid. And we'd say, well, if you buy it right now, <coughs> you get <coughs> two of them. Lou will engrave the name of the kid on the gun right here while you're here. And so I'd stop and put somebody's name on it. And we tripled his sales of his rubber guns just by adding that little advantage on there. That's that interactive marketing stuff that Jose and... Ken Brown and Ron Snaberger are so good at. But he could make a damn good living selling rubber guns. And I kept trying to get him to put his name up in front and to try and start looking at it from completely a different way to go because it really wasn't a rubber gun that he was selling. And I could never get him to, to rethink his thinking. When Wally Goddard carved that sign for me, it was before there was even a company. Somebody still has their mic on. Can you check your mics, all of you? And, and as I've gone down the road, I don't remember where Firestarter came from, but I really like starting fires in people's life, the fire within. I'm an old scouter. I love fire building, and so that had something to do with it. But conjuring is where I go play to come up with new ideas and my innovative bent as well. And I've played with these concepts and stayed on them now for 38 years. And I'm just trying to help everyone before I die, before I'm gone, have you realize how helpful it is to, to study and learn a little of this stuff. Don't make it be something that you avoid you've got to swim in it. You've got to begin to say, well, if I could discover that I had some ability and then I can get in here and really work hard at developing it and master some of this, then I've got something to share. And there's just no reason not to start looking at branding as a concept that you're going to overcome. And then that sharing of that effort between all of us to help us get better is my passionate prescription now. So if you have not gotten in the Master's Apprentice program, it sure is time to kind of consider that. And let me try and tweak it a little bit. I have an apprentice program where you get more involved. You're certainly welcome to just do it all on your own if you're that hard-headed. But I think it really can help at this point, okay? From an uh, amateur to an apprentice to a technician to an artisan to a pro. Right here, you're full-time. It's pretty easy to measure these steps of progress. And then we turn you into a coach and a trainer, and then we turn you into a master, and then then's when you really start kind of having fun with your life. The INE network is a balance of, of both these skills. I've never given a master who's not making a better effort at trying to sell their work and make that even efforts of whatever you're going after. When Keith Hone got started with this, uh, he came up with the magical two hours a day 
kind of an angle, and it was mostly because there was a guy at school that worked eight hours a day as a school teacher, and then he worked another eight-hour shift to try to get ahead. And Keith figured if he could go home and work another eight hours and then still have a life, he said, I figured I could give my art business at least two hours a day. And we pretty much feel that that's kind of the line in the sand. If you can't find two hours a day to give this, it's going to stay a really great hobby. Uh, if you can give it any more than that, then whoa, good luck. Here we go. Let's put some wings on those dreams and take off. But less than a really steady, dedicated kind of commitment to learning both how to make it and how to market it, you're not likely to have a real successful studio. I've produced a lot of information in this last 20 years. And I don't know how many of you have gone through the trade wins. I don't know how many of you know the 52 cards of the game that I put together. I don't know if you've been through upscale marketing. Uh, I don't know if you've really dug into the factors that influence small business, but I usually tell when I'm visiting with people whether that matters to them or not, and it's almost always, no, it's how good I am at drawing, it's how good I am at carving, it's how good I am at engraving. And I'm just pleading with you to at least level a playing field. Dig into the business side and let's see if we can't, can't really make that work. I don't know how many hours you've invested in your business this year or how many you plan to visit in business this year, but I hope you'll balance the effort between the things you've learned and the things you have yet to learn. If you haven't gotten your copy of the business plan and you're not digging into that, then you're really shooting yourself in the foot. I think it's the best thing that I've done so far in my life. It is a business plan, and it's not particularly fun to wade into it nor get through it. But I guarantee if you haven't got a target and you've got, got things somewhat figured out, the odds go way down that you're actually going to succeed. And I'm usually aware that you haven't got a business plan because in the back of the business plan, I tell you to send it to me so that I can then begin to help. And I'm at the other end of my life now, I'm the other end of my career, and I'm just simply not going to help those who don't bother to do what I suggest. I don't care at what stage of your business or your life you're in, you can't, you shouldn't go further forward without a business plan. The real purposes of the business plan and the brand are to guide your directions. And you want to control how you present yourself to the world. And instead of being all over the place, every right brain person I know is all over the place. That's how our brain thinks. That's how we go at life. <coughs> and maybe why we tend to avoid a brand is because that's an effort to target us, to focus our efforts, to bring us into a position where we can come up with something that is a rememberable image, which is sight, a rememberable sound, which is hearing, a rememberable feel, a rememberable taste, and a rememberable smell. Can you imagine what a story, a rememberable story does to people's intuition? and how much you can light up their imagination the second they begin to see there's something here for themselves. <coughs> this is a way of thinking, and it's usually what we share, how we plant in another person's life. If your story and your product and who you are touches sight, sound, touching, smell, taste, and intuitive and imaginative, you're going to be deadly in the marketplace. <coughs> and I'm sharing with you the top secret of this whole thing. A brand is a lightning rod. You want the lightning to hit, but you want it to come to where you want it to. And I don't see anybody else in the marketplace uh, using this comparison or this analogy, but it is freaking perfect. 
you want to run lightning rod up out in the marketplace amongst a certain kind of customer and then expect them to actually react. Once you're starting to pay attention to this branding thing, you'll see it all around you because it really is a balancing act and it's a constant ongoing effort to develop your brand and then stay pretty damn close to it. Okay. And whenever you see it, then this is somebody that you should really try to emulate. Not copy, but do it in a way that helps you to realize what's really going on. Gary is uh, one of the artists who helped found the i &E Network. <coughs> Tammy and Keith and Gary and I started this whole thing in 1983. I mentioned last week that I got to visit with Gary the other night. We talked for quite a while about his new books and things coming out. And I think Gary is one of the best marketing artists on the planet. And Gary is the one, see, that designed the hands and has let us use the hands for all these years. And I don't know how you can't not see what he's doing in his own circumstance and then have that then turn in turn begin to influence some of your efforts. This is one of the cutest stories. One day Gary came home and he had shaved his hair all off and his wife just had a tizzy that he'd cut his hair all off. So he took all his boys, went down and got their hair all cut off. <laughs> ah, we laugh about that one every time we meet. This is one of his most famous uh, brand ideas. These are garden and uh, and uh, sentiment pieces and he's done all kinds of famous people sitting on these benches and uh, sold them all over the world. If you are beginning to grasp what a single symbol can do and realize <clears throat> the high contrast image of Colonel Sanders and how deadly it is, the high contrast image of John Wayne and how deadly that is, Jack, uh, Jack Benny never went anywhere without that damn violin because it branded him and helped people realize and and tie him instead of all the other comedians to him, his name and who he was and what he was selling with the world. I read a story one time that really affected me when I was getting ready to do all these branding sessions where a guy was starving to death. He had, had his implements destroyed somehow and and he crawled into a cave to die because he was pretty tired of trying to catch fish or in a stream and fish, but he could not catch him. He was then laying on the floor and etched on the wall was a, a guy throwing a stick that had a barb on it like this one. And the guy had stabbed himself a fish. <laughs> so all it was was a petroglyph that saved his life, but that's kind of what you're looking for and representing here is that if you can boil your life down into a graphic image and then you can tie all the other sensations to it, you will have one of the best brands in the, in the world. As I left dentistry, I left dentistry for several reasons and I didn't understand the path that I'm on now to begin with, but I really like how things go in my own world because I paid attention to how they're going and I didn't wait till everything happened by accident. My ordinary miracle is, is every bit just an ordinary miracle. But it came along because I did a lot of doing. I lifted every stone and made every effort to try and make things work out. You boil down opportunity intersection and success mountain, it all starts with a dream <clears throat> and that produces hope and faith. So January we did the dream. Now we're looking at the map and the plan and that produces purpose and direction. After we get these sessions done, then we're going to work on the preparations and that's going to produce the energy and the commitment that it needs. And then we're going to launch your studio and your efforts. And from that point on, where Jose is now is constantly, it rotates between checking directions and keeping really accurate measurement of how you're doing. 
<coughs> creates problem solving, and that produces progress and solves business problems. And and it's so fun because our mixture here is going to be better than ever before. In the past, it's been really challenging for me to work with so many people in our circle. But now we're developing a new format of training and a new format of mixing and a new format of sustaining each other's efforts. And this Google Plus is what's going to do it all. And from then on, it's going to be a matter of sharing and trading in the marketplace. This was the cover of Fast Company magazine. You ever pick Fast Company up? Ever read that magazine? Or are you always just over in the art books? Me and Jose are learning now art books in the car, but every now and again I do read Fast Company. <laughs> so the theory of a personal and now. Defined as a creation of an asset that pertains to a particular person. This includes that and is not limited to the body, the clothing, the appearance, the knowledge. Everything that leads to an indelible impression that is uniquely distinguishable and remarkable. Rememberable. <coughs> when Jose dresses up with his vest and puts his derby on and goes to work at a gun show, do you think he's rememberable? I think he will tell you that he's worked really hard on his image for quite some time. And this recent relationship that's come into his life that's just amazing. It's come from so much effort. Term printing is a tribute and first discussed by others, remember? The effort to get the signals of the things that you prefer I think come to us. I like this and I like this and oh my gosh and I like that. <clears throat> when you're working and playing and trying things, how can you go through a magazine or scan your stream on Google Plus and not have certain images or certain quotes and thoughts just smack you? For some reason the timing is just perfect for those ideas. And if you can begin to sort out, okay, there's something that I particularly like. The incubative process of discovering the best you is what I want my whole life to represent. And so it is not hard for me to play with the images and the concepts that I have, and that's what I use in my marketing. So are you willing to bet the rest of your future, or the lack thereof, on the fact that you do or don't know what a good personal brand is and how to use it. I uh, hope at this point I've got your attention. So we're going to get ourselves in gear and we're going to learn how to do it. We're going to get better and better at it. Steve Covey called it the North Star. No longer going to take just any road. We're going to figure out exactly where we're going. In working in the context of ultra-famous brands like Dior and Vitron, <clears throat> Creative spirits are always going to feel reined in, but it's important that they are free to develop ideas. And rather than attracting from the principal job, that reinforces it. I think of money invested in brand development as venture capital. It's not a big investment compared to the actual returns. When, when I see quotes and concepts like this and I put them in my journal, uh, you need to do the same and put it somewhere in your life. Screen capture this and put it in your life and then start trying to figure out what the hell's he mean. And this is a want world too. Extremely expensive fashion and accessory business. And that's people that we could really, really learn a lot from. All of you should know Jeff. A brand for a company is like a reputation for a person. You earn a reputation by trying to do things, hard things, well. You think Amazon's done fairly well? <laughs> a brand that captures your mind gains behavior, but a brand that captures your heart gains commitment. So which one do you want? 
who do you want to become and what are you after? Took me seven years to zero in on Success Mountain. I am going to stay on this till I die now. I like the idea of us helping each other and inspiring and encouraging each other. But I've found my pathway and what I want to do is lock arms with all of you. And then we go help as many people as we can find something similar. Because there's just not much better than a profitable hobby. So you brand yourself or are you going to wait till the market tends to brand it for you? And you still think it's an accident or hopefully you're beginning to sense it's done by pattern and by design. So this show is the theory of the marketplace and why personal brand works well and the real value and the real product and the four parts of personal brand. Next week's show is going to be basically how to begin to build your brand. And then the third show will be on how to actually begin to use your brand. Okay. When you look in the mirror, near mirror on the wall, what do you see? But it's more what you hope to see, what you wish you could see, what you're dreaming about, the direction you're trying to take your life. Okay? And it's a never-ending process. So if you're trying to make some decisions tonight, I hope what you'll do is really lock in and pick up those threads of interest that you have and just start making a really, really serious effort to develop a compass in your life. Get your brand in a position where you can actually do something with it. And as we climb the success mountain together, the basic premise is it will definitely be uphill. And there's not somebody else going to come along and do it for you. Cannot wait and shift the gears a bunch of times in your life and end up getting anywhere. Success is not measured by what a person accomplishes, but by the opposition they have encountered and the courage with which they have maintained the struggle against those overwhelming odds. It is also one of commitment. Not necessarily an easy thing. So the master's program is how to do well in the marketplace and then develop your own individual technical skills. And the primary business tool box is when you trade anything, it's better to just sit down and trade or to be ahead of whatever that game is. Every time I talk about uh, success in the marketplace like playing a game of chess, people who think ahead their moves in chess do really well and people who wait and make their moves as they show up don't do really well. Somebody still has their mic open. Can I get somebody, to one of you to check that and turn your mics off? When Keith Holmes started playing with me, it was he was coming right out of high school and been teaching shop and industrial art for a long time. And it was an issue for him to begin with to realize he had to become technically really good at the art, but also become really good at his marketing efforts because every artist says, I'm terrible at marketing, but they don't make the efforts to fix that or to improve that. So for the next show, this is an assignment tonight. If you could hand out a card to a thousand people and I'd pay for the card and hand them out for you, I do that distribution work thing for you, what would you most want to say on it? Who are you and what are you doing with the rest of your life? Another way to kind of think about this is to if I bought you a billboard. There's 30 million people go by our, our freeway down here on I-15. And I bought a billboard for a year. And you could put anything on the billboard. What would you want to say? And should not that very quick, instantaneous interaction with people be your brand? What are you trying to really trying to sell? 
what if you could do something right now that would be around influencing people from now on? Every time I read this from Mark Twain, I chuckle. <laughs> because what you're after is this kind of description, this kind of interaction, this kind of thought process that just grabs people <laughs> as if they grab the tail of a cat. It is a tool. And you're either going to learn to use it or you will, will not. So stage one was the theory. Stage two will then begin to begin to build your image, and then we're going to teach you how to use it. Now, if you had a chance to be on the elevator with Oprah Winfrey or Martha Stewart, and they were going to let you talk on their shows about who you are and what you're doing, God, Lord, don't have it be. I wish I'd have been more prepared for that moment because it often shows up very instantaneously. And you can't think, well, when it comes up, then I'll worry about it. I'm going, no, get ahead of it. If a farmer had some land and he gave the farmer a choice, he'd plant land, whatever he chooses, the land doesn't care. It's up to the farmer to make the decision. We're comparing human mind with the land because the mind, like the land, doesn't care what you plant in it. It will return what you plant, but it doesn't care what you plant. So the farmer has two seeds. One is a seed of corn, the other is a seed of nightshade. He digs two little holes in the earth and he plants both one corn and one nightshade. Covers up the holes and waters them and invariably the land will return what was planted. And as written in the Bible, so as we, as we sow, so shall we reap. <coughs> but the land doesn't care. It grows corn and poison. The human mind's far more fertile but far more incredibly and mysterious than the land. But it works exactly the same way. Doesn't care what we plant, success or failure. Isn't that the most amazing thought? And as we talked last week in the show that we're our own worst problem. And the seeds that we're planting, there's all that can grow. Once they've met you, you want to have them think of you positively and simply and react well in your direction. Remember the lightning. Try tonight before you go to bed to rate yourself on your artistic future and what you sense your successful potential is likely to be. Honestly, just say to yourself where, you know, 2%, 20%, 80%, 100%. What do you think your future is likely to be? <coughs> and that number is an indication of your self-thought. And that is really serious. And is there a way for you to improve that? What if we continue to try and plant better seeds? I can take you to the Green River and go fishing with me, and I don't care. It's the most highly populated fishing river in the in the world now, 14,000 fish per mile. Enough fish in that river, you can walk across it practically on the fish backs. And if I take you up there to try and catch some fish, you'll have a really tough time catching them because it's catch and release, and they get fished a ton. And so unless you know how to fish, you're going to starve. You, you're not going to do well. And yet I can put a person right in the same hole where you weren't catching anything and have that person catch 100, 150 fish a day out of the same hole. And it's because we just don't know what we're doing. we got to plant some altruistic seeds of value. You know what altruistic means? It's the stuff that makes artists succeed, okay? 
remember me and remember me in good light from now on. It is idealism, it's high-mindedness, it's benevolence, loftiness, and selfishness, magnanimous, generous, noble, big-hearted, and selfish. Every master could wear this flag. I can embroider it on the back of their on the back of their coats, every one of them. Ron is that way. One of the most unselfish people I think I've ever met. Uh, I've worked with him for years. Jose is the same kind of person. And so is Craig. So is Mal. So is Nick and Joni. I couldn't find your pictures this afternoon, Joni. I've got them in my file, but I couldn't bring them up. So I'm sorry to not put you up in here tonight, Jer. I will fix that. Greg Woodard, our first world champion. Tamarie. Never met a more concerned and caring individual. Every day, new doors of opportunity open up, and most of us miss them because it just seems like too much work. So we're going to build a marketing selling pathway now, and branding is going to do it. We're going to brand you, and then we're going to market you. We're going to work at advertising and PR. They are all four different elements of the fishing process. But branding is the actual fish, fish hook. It's what keeps people coming your way. Marketing is the process of fishing and throwing it out there. We use totally word of mouth. Kelly Thurgood had one of the greatest days in the world. We had all gone up with our master circle <coughs> to just show up the salt palace and Everyone sold something that weekend but Kelly. But we were working with developing leads and how to do the ongoing business marketing relationships. And the following Thursday, he followed through on his leads and he had 60000 in sales. I think I've told the story before. One of the really great stories in our circle. And if you can just sense that there's a reason we connect with each other, there's a reason we're paying attention to these concepts and these issues, it is the total pie. It isn't just one tiny little thing. It is what we do so that someone will facilitate the exchange between artist and patron. And that someone is you. You can hire this done and go have somebody do it all for you, but I guarantee you, you don't have enough money. It's one of the most expensive categories in the marketplace. I say, okay, I'm too busy or I don't want to learn or I don't know. I'll just write you out a check and let you do it all for me. If you're that wealthy and want me to do it for you, you give me a call. I got No, you won't call me. I'm, my fee's too nasty. When I met Boyd K. 50, over 50 years ago, he told me, son, you can dream up a great life and then invest every day trying to make your dreams come true. I got to sit with him about six months ago when we gave that crystal prayer to the church and got to spend some time with this great old lion. And He says, well, did it stick, Lewis? <laughs> and I said, sir, you don't know anybody who's had more fun with their life than me. And I hope that image is you. And you realize you really do have something incredibly good inside of you. Something that is different than ordinary. Every one of you have an extraordinary side. And it's up to each of us to dig that out. And 
incubate it and cultivate it till we can actually make it work. When we get together, good things happen. Every time this bunch starts talking and playing and sharing ideas and mixing, it just sets off a fire that just is unbelievable, and we all get more out of it. And I think the IDE network, because we're succeeding together, will one day be a really great tool for all artistic types as they try to take on the marketplace together. Okay, next time we're going to begin to build your brand. And uh, I'd like you to do your homework between now and next week. Really think about what your brand might be if someone zoomed by on the freeway and all they saw was a billboard. Uh, what might you be able to pull into place, okay? I'm going to finish with my paid political announcement. Uh, people in my apprentice program, I expect you to be a part of the ID circle. And I expect you to get, get the business plan, and get started on your business plan, get opportunity intersection, and get that done. And then I'll, and then I'll do more. I'll try and help you more as well. A lot of people who bump into us or who have been a part of the circle don't think that that <clears throat> two fifty a week is worth it. And I'm just going, okay, go ahead and do it on your own. Then dig this all out on your own and figure it out. But for those of you that really do need the help and really realize what I've shown you and talked about tonight, uh, you'll never forget Barry Peters or Tom Peterson, Barry Swartz. Even if you don't know how to smell it, spell it, call, call Mel. He'll help you figure it out. Okay? <laughs> See, now you guys all know why I keep Mel around. He is really, really helpful. Okay, any questions and we've, we'll finish it up. We've had a little long time, but... Lou, I've got a statement. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, if you do nothing and expect nothing, you cannot be surprised when you get nothing. <laughs> Bingo. So in order to affect change in your life, you have to make a decision to do something. Yeah. And isn't it more than you've done? I mean, obviously what we've done is what's gotten our thinking to where it is. So now to do more, we got to change our thinking. We have to come at it from a different angle. You ought to post that tomorrow morning, Mel. Put that into a, into a graphic and a sign and post that sucker. That's a good quote. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's kind of what my whole life has been, a matter <laughs> of change. Being a service brat growing up, we were moving every couple of years because the old man was stationed different places. <laughs> so you had to learn how to adapt. Yeah. Yeah, that's the human experience is adaptation completely. Dean? Yeah, I'm just curious. The idea of, of coming up with a business card and what you'd want out and everything I think is excellent, but I'm just wondering with the prevalence of the internet and the fact that you almost have to be marketing on the internet and everything, don't you really need a website or can you be effective uh, putting yourself out there? Uh, seems like it's almost impossible for anybody to sell anything these days. Without that well, we're learning how, Dean. Uh, if yeah, you understand. listened when uh, what Jay put up uh, a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about the fact he posted that crystal vase and he's got two really great orders off of that post because when you post on Google Plus that's a mini blog. True. But what True. we have to what we're learning is what do I put up there? Cuz right. you can talk about the dinner you had yesterday or your crappy yeah. neighbor and that's, that's not going to likely help you, you know. What you've got to do is literally we're, and we're sorting it out together. I mean, I'm not sure I know any more than anybody else about well, how this tool works. But I will promise you one thing. I'm going to figure it out. I'm I right. am going to figure it out. Thank you, Dean. Okay, thank you. Michael. Yes, sir, Dr. Lowe. Uh, you, you know I am... Um, Unique and unusual, but my request is 
I want to nominate Robin Colson as the next INE Network master as soon as possible. Okay. Well, let me explain how that works, Michael. Uh, okay. The only way she'll become a network master is if I decide. I'm I I'm the last person in the loop. Okay. Absolutely. And what, and what I what I watch for is a degree of success in both the quality of the work and the price ranges, and and so I kind of hold that card and hold it back. There's some people on the show tonight, even, and members who waited a long time. To become a master in the circle, and so I'm trying to elevate the demand as much as I possibly can, Mike. But I sure do respect the the uh, the opinion, and I respect your s submission of Raman because she is certainly going to be a master in the circle. There's no question; she is just extraordinary. And so now, what we're trying to do is put her footprints in the in the sand on the sidewalk and her brand on the sidewalk. So that she can then succeed from then on as well. Thank you. Anybody else you for got your a, opinion? You betcha. Anybody else got an opinion they want to throw into this tonight? There's a lot of meat here, and I'm going to take these shows now. How I'm going to work with these next few shows? Branding is a master series, and I think extremely valuable. And so I'm recording them, but I'm going to re-record them and put them into a set that can then be downloaded and sold through Tammy through Proper Hobbies. And so to go get it on that and go back through it now for free is just not going to happen. Right, these, are, these are too much. There's just so much good stuff here. But there's a lot you've got to go back and think about and review and go through as well. So I'm going to take this one down. And then I'm going to re-record them and make them available through the INE network and through Tammy. So the follow-up. Now that will be even more so on the next series is how to use your, how to start to build your brand. And then the last show is deadly with how in the world do I use a brand and make it actually work. And then I'm going to do that same thing with upscale marketing. I was going to do it last year when I got these series done but I had trouble with the recording process and now it just goes right straight to YouTube and I have her I have her done <laughs> automatically now so those of you that are members will get access to this and and those who are not members I want you to think about it and realize what we're doing here uh, pretty hard for me to pay the bills and disseminate it without having some kind of in the line sand kind of a fee and uh, 10 bucks a month seems to me to be an awfully reasonable number for this kind of information and kind of help. Okay, I saw a hand. Anybody else? Joni? I don't know. This is just a, a thought that came to me a few moments ago as you were talking. And I, for one, when I started doing my artwork and joined the INE and doing my thing, I felt like, well, yeah, this is fine. You know, this is good. I like it. But when I be, when we started communicating all of us, and we started talking, and one helps the other. I suddenly realized I belong. I belong yes. to a family. Yes, you do, Joey. You really do. And you contribute. I mean, what you've done and what you've gone through is a section of learning and understanding that none of the rest of us have gone through exactly. And when we mix that, we all benefit. Yeah, there, there's no question. This is just the wave of the future. Can you imagine how much better the art artist and doing well in the marketplace would have been had we had this kind of a tool all our lives? Yeah. The it, kids it, coming up now are going to have it. You've all made a difference in my life. Well, you have ours, Johnny. Bless you. And you know what? Your persistence, lady, is what I like the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you, I'm do sick know, you don't know how to hang in there, girl. <laughs> no I mean, question. I'm sick headed, one or the other, or a combination. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, Jay should be next. Oh, okay. Jay, go for it, bud. Yeah, well, you know, you were talking about, you know, the branding and putting out there, you know, putting ourselves out there, you know, the. In a way that it catches people's attention, it catches their eye, things like that. I was doing some thinking today and went down and talked to 
um, my digital graphics place here where I get my banners made up at uh, for when I go out and do these motorcycle events and stuff. And I got to think back, you know, some of the other banners I've seen people, you know, use and where they put them at, you know, on top of their canopies or, you know, to the side of their trailers or, you know, or whatever. I got to think, you know, I wanted to do something different, you know. So yeah. I went down, went down and talked to them, and I'm having a whole new banner made up where, since I'm doing more motorcycles and things like that, they're changing it over from kind of a wood grain look to a metal look. And then they're taking, um, they're going to pull pictures off of my uh, Pinterest page of different projects and different things that I've worked on and done. And those are going to be all, you know, on my banner. And then when yeah, I set my banner yeah, up, yeah. instead of being like on top of my canopy or something, it will be used as my table skirt. Oh, bingo, yes. <laughs> because you got most of these bike rallies, most of them, they're not looking up in the air or whatever. Most of them are, you know, pretty much looking at the ground, make sure they don't trip over a beer bottle or something. But, you know, still, they're, they're looking down at, you know, at, at eye level and kind of down towards the ground and, at the, you know, at table level. So I figure if I put my banner right around the front of my table, they can't help but see it. Good. And then Good having idea. all those pictures on there. You know, they're going to remember, well, he had that oddball-looking banner that had all those pictures on the things that he's done. Yeah. Neat, neat, neat. I'm going to give you one really additional little hint, and all of you should listen to this really carefully. I've done a thousand shows in my lifetime, in my career, at least a thousand, and I learned fairly quickly that when people walk up to your life and you've got a table, if it's table height, which is 32 inches high, they have to sort of bend down to look at the kind of stuff that we engrave and do. And you'll be really smart to take a 9-inch piece of PVC pipe, cut it 9 inches long, inch and a half round PVC pipe, slide it over the legs of the table, and boost your table 9 inches higher. So when people come up, they can stand up to your booth, and they're right. The stuff is right there. They can get a good close look without having to reach down and bend down to your table. Now, if you run your skirt a little longer, and then put your banner in front of that, Jay, you'll have a perfect position, eyeball position for your your signage and your pictures, and that's going to help you a ton. I always was startled that people would do shows and do shows and do shows, and and they buy those tables from Kmart and. Walmart and everybody else, but the height of those tables is down too far. Every gun show you go to, the people that know what the hell they're doing have got their gun tables boosted, and everybody else is down at regular table height. So one extra little tidbit tonight that will make a huge difference in your overall business. Yep. Jose, <clears throat> isn't that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's one of the things that I've, uh, one of the little tricks that I learned. You lift boost. it up a little bit higher. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. How are you sleeping at night? Are you getting any sleep, bud, or are you still wound up? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's still kind of hard to go to sleep, you know, with all these plans that I'm trying to do here, and it, it's just incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you're going to hold off on telling you the whole story because we just have so much grand news for Jose. He, he's going to freak out every one of you when we lock, drop this one into place, huh, Jose? Yeah, I'm hoping uh, this, uh, well, hopefully Valentine's Day, that's when I'm going to receive uh, something in the mail here. So uh, <laughs> okay. you'll be the first to know. <laughs> I'm sure I will, but I'll be thrilled yeah. to death for you. We'll it was hard for me to go to sleep last night because if I could help you, help you pull this one in, I would grab hold. I'm trying to help you every way I can, but this is one you kind of have to build yourself. But, oh, you've done a great job so far. And you guys are going to be so damn proud of Jose. You're going to be freaked out when we lay this one out for you. Well, if you would have told me uh, that this was going to be happening here, you know, back when we first met, I would have told you, I, I don't think so. No, no way. There's yeah. no way. But no way. <laughs> this is really awesome. When, when Craig sold the 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 uh, fireplace mantle a couple of years ago to the, the author in San Diego, he asked him for 70000 for the fireplace mantle. 
hand carved walnut, hand carved fireplace mantel. And you've got to know that would push everybody I know damn near off a cliff to just have the guts to be able to say this is how much it is. Mm -hmm. And then know how to present that and then shut up and close the deal. And then when he went down and installed the damn thing, the guy gave him $2,500 tip on top of that. Wow. And these doors, Robin's going to get to do the doors for Kathy Ireland for her new ranch in, in Hawaii. And it's one of her very first jobs. And it's going to be it's probably going to be six figures. I'm pretty sure we're going to get over hundred grand for that one. And most all of you are shooting way too low. You're, you're just, your price range, you're so scared of selling and marketing and trading you and your work. And all I'm trying to do is help you just aim higher. Look a little higher and try to position yourself a little better. I mean, Dean and, Matt and Ron live in the neighborhood, the most wealthy neighborhood in this country. And there's no reason not to find some way to trade with the upscale customer. If you keep trading with the bottom half of the economy, we all kind of know where we're going to be, don't we? Right. right. We got to we got to be up in here with the really well-off crowd. Mm -hmm. So, we'll finish branding and then we'll take on upscale marketing. All right, any other comments? We hit it pretty hard tonight, guys, but Mike, appreciate it. Yeah, well, Mike, I didn't see you. There you go, bud. Yeah, Dr. Lou, uh, as mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've sent you an email, and uh, I'm trying to help the blind angel. Okay. If this, if this cannot be accomplished, I understand, but I would like to try to help her, but I, I need some, some help how to do this. Yes, I ask you to hold off just a minute till we can kind of discuss what might work best. What we're going to do is uh, she needs some funding, and Michael's done some work that he's going to try and auction off, and we're going to try and use Google Plus to launch that. So I think I can get to it between now and, and through the weekend, Michael, so I'll try and get in touch with you directly, and we'll do that. Thank you, Dr. Lou. I'm gone for the weekend. Uh, we're going camping to the uh, ocean, so uh, oh. if you could help me, I'd appreciate it. I only have 75 people in my in my circle, so if you've got 4,000 people, if you could possibly auction this with 4,000 people, that would really be way better uh, option than what I have. Well, why don't we why don't we even think bigger because we've got access to millions now with Google Plus. Uh, so what we're going to do is you. we'll hit it all. I I have one whole show that I do on this charity fundraising exposure kind of me vehicle, and it's worked extremely well for the beginnings of most of the masters. Of, I've tried this as well. So this is a good move, Mike. It's really a very thoughtful thing to do for, for Sue, and if we can launch something there, good deal. So we'll work on it. I'll call you and, and get in touch with you directly, all right? Thank you very much. You are my hero. <laughs> and and well, I'm, sure, I'm sure Sue will really appreciate anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be a fun thing for her. She does need the help. She really does. Well, the fun part for me is I, I spend all my time trying to help you see what the tiger you've got hold by the tail here. Guys, There's we're each of us can have our own production facilities now. Used to be you had to write a book, you had to go to somebody else to publish and distribute it, and guess who made all the money? Used to be if you wanted to do a television show, you had to go get somebody else to do all that for you. And guess who made all the money? So literally now we can we're moving in a direction where we can now do this ourselves. And I don't know if you feel like this is a pioneering kind of effort. It sure as hell is when I get on the show and I can't figure out which buttons to push. <laughs> and uh, Mel has to tell me how to spell words, and Ron has to call me up, and make sure that I remember this person and this person and this person. And all of us are we're we're way better together than we would ever have been on our own. But we're cutting some really new territory here. 
and I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you bothering to stay with it because this is a tool that will allow you for exposure, exposure, exposure. Normally the most expensive part of all business marketing is that exposure mechanism and we're now pioneering it for as, as reasonable as it has ever been. I don't know how you can do this on a better basis than what Google Plus allows. So, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow night. We'll sit down and visit about blogging. We're going to talk you. about your profiles and move things along, okay? Thank right. you, everybody. Thank and you.